Project Communications Management. Here we're going to be discussing how to plan our project communications, manage those communications, and control those communications. Our inputs for planning communications management include our project management plan, our stakeholder register, our enterprise environmental factors, and our organizational process assets. We use tools like a communication requirements analysis. Basically, what does it take? What do we need for communications within our project? We also look at the communication technologies, both those that are available to us that we currently are using within the organization, within the project teams, and any other communications that may be necessary for our unique project that we're working on. We'll look at communication models, how communication actually occurs, and we'll look at that as a way of improving our communication skills and methods of communication also to improve our communication between our team and with our stakeholders. Meetings are always a useful tool and of course we use that within communications. Our outputs include our communication management plan, any project document updates that we need, now, our communication plan requirements include who needs to receive which information, what time frames. So we need to understand who are the people that we're communicating with, who are the stakeholders. That's why the register is important. We also need to know in what time frames. Some people need more information than others. That's typical. You don't want to send emails to every executive all the time that may be just filling their email box and making them uh, not very friendly because any email we get that is not requested or necessary becomes noise in our email boxes. So understanding in our plan right away who is receiving what and in what time frame and what's to be stored and who can access this, how it is the, the storage method accessed. So in our communication plan should be the idea that we are retaining documentation. We've talked about it. We've talked about the project management plan and the project documents that are updated, but we haven't talked specifically how they are stored, where they are stored, and who gets ac access to which items. So that's part of this communication management plan, which is part of the project management plan. We look in here for formats of the information. I mean, is, some projects are run on paper. You can do that. It is not, there's nothing wrong with that. There's not a problem with using a paper source. Though most companies are electronic and they store things on common servers or SharePoint or some other collaborative medium that they're using. We need to understand that and what access and what format that information is to be stored in. We need to be understand any language that cross-cultural multinational time zone barriers if they exist. So we can't, if Data is to be available to everybody all the time. We need to make clear of that. If it's to be available at certain times, we need to be clear what that means both for our time zone and for everyone else who would have access to it. So communication vehicles. These are what carry communications. The team meeting minutes are communications. They carry pertinent information and should be stored. The project documentation, project plan, et cetera, et cetera, all those documents we talk about updating, those are part of our communication vehicles. They help us understand what we're doing, when we're doing it, how we're doing it, who we're doing it for, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So communication is a key element to what we do as project managers. 
and we need to make sure that all our communications are clear and accessible to all parties who need them in vehicles and methodologies that are appropriate. Our stakeholder assessments are important communication vehicles. We should know uh, something about the stakeholders and whether those are accessible to everyone or not is a project choice. I typically have notes on stakeholders that I keep in my personal journal, meaning the communication I have with myself so that I understand how to work with people, uh, when they're available, that kind of thing. If there's any particular details to it, it doesn't need to necessarily be part of the public uh, project information. But anything that you need in, in terms of the stakeholders, you should document. Charter is, part, is one of those vehicles of, of information important to the, to the project. Any brainstorming sessions, the notes thereof, uh, pictures of boards that you've uh, covered up with writing may be part of that. Again, the format of things could be various. It may not all be uh, Word documents. It could be pictures, JPEG files, etc. Any documents from requiring requirement gathering sessions are, are part of these vehicles. Also, the requirement documents themselves. The communication plan itself is one of the vehicles. An issues log. Anytime we log issues and keep up with that, because that's an ongoing document, we need to have that as well. And the risk register. We'll be talking about the risk register and, and how it's created, but it is still a, a very important piece of the communications. Now, our communication technology. Um, we need to understand the urgency of communications. So how urgent do we use which technologies? For instance, sending a letter is less urgent than an email because an email is almost instantaneous. Talking to someone on the phone, if it's a cell phone, can be even more urgent than an email. Texting is anyone's guess. It just depends on your ground rules of your team and how you deal with uh, the texting piece of the technology as it exists today. The availability is another thing. How urgent is it? The availability of the technologies that you have. Do you have cell phone coverage? Not everyone does. Some buildings shut it down and they use only landlines. That's still done in certain secured areas. So be aware of what the availability of certain technologies. I've worked with companies that use outside texting, like Skype, for instance, as their universal type of texting device. Other have more secure texting within the corporate headquarters or corporate offices. Ease of use. If it's not easy for people to use, which is a combination of familiarity and training, then people generally will not use the communication or will use it uh, not completely or sparingly. The project team's specific work arrangements, how are you configured within the actual workspace? Are you in an office environment, a, uh, a cubicle farm? Are you co-located? Are you virtual? Are you in multiple buildings on a campus, multiple buildings within a city? Those are all very important to understanding the technologies that would be appropriate. The sensitivity of the information, as touched on before, I've known companies that had texting through a general texting company uh, that was really exposed to the outside. Though the information is still encrypted, it's, it's more widely available than it would be if it were within a firewalled environment secured area. It's important to know the sensitivity of the information you're dealing with. If you're a government entity or heavily regulated, those factors need to be taken into account when you dis to decide on your communication technology and how you're disseminating different pieces of information. 
Here's a general communication model itself. You can see here that it, it, this is a standard model. There's nothing fancy here. We have a sender on one side that encodes a message. It is decoded by a receiver who will encode a response that is decoded by the sender. So it's a circular path. That's how we communicate with each other in general. And when we have breakdowns in communication, generally speaking, there is a problem with this kind of model, meaning that something in this broke. We either, as the sender, did not encode the message correctly, or the receiver did not decode the message. That simply means we had confusion. You didn't understand what I said. Either I garbled the message in the sending of it, or when you heard it, you didn't hear the words either properly, correctly, accurately, however you want to put it. So that's where we have our breakdowns. And this model works for personal communications. It works for uh, system communications, etc. If I have a machine talking to another machine, this model works the same way. It's more complicated at times, one could say, but it is the same process. And it's good to look at this and have a, an understanding of it when we look at projects, because typically we're communicating a lot. And a lot of our problems we have, a lot of the conflicts we have, a lot of the negotiations that we have and, and need for negotiation is over problems with communication. Now, we, we managing communication, there are some key statistics that we look at within our certification area. These are widely known and widely held uh, areas. So body language, what percentage of our communication is our body language or facial expressions? 55%. Now this is a, this is a loose number, meaning that there are other studies that may slide it up or down depending on how you're communicating. Plus it's specific to people and things that you're doing. But generally speaking, when two people are communicating, your body language and facial expressions say more than anything else. It's one of the reasons that we use this type of communication in this training, that I can look forward, you can see my facial expressions, and that's part of my communication. You can see somewhat my body language, depending on how we edit it. But those are critical factors in my expressing the meaning I'm trying to get across. Now, pitch and the tone of voice represent 38%. So already we have the majority of what's being communicated to you being communicated without the words being spoken. So it's how you are hearing it and seeing it that means a lot. Now, in personal one-on-one -on -one communication, that is huge. And think about it. How much do we know about what someone or what we feel someone is communicating just by looking and listening to them? And that's what we're talking about. Now, it's not the only thing that's important. And like I said, these, these are numbers that were gathered a number of years ago and they may or may not be uh, completely accurate, I will say, but they're generally well thought of as general guideposts to what we're doing. So, word spoken would be the rest at 7%. So the word spoken is the least important. That is a key thing when you think about projects and like meetings when you're meeting with your team. As a project manager, you should be scanning the room to read not only what people are saying to you and listening to them, but also looking at the body language, looking at what their facial expressions say, 
that can help you clue you in to potential problems, to issues, to questions that aren't being asked, to situations. We all know this. We all have sat in meetings. What I'm pointing out is that there's a reason why you should do this, and it's a valid reason to be observant and to be mindful and to listen. Now, the estimated percentage of time that a project manager communicates, this is important, 90%. Ninety percent of the time that we spend as project managers, we are communicating, meaning we are talking to people, we are meeting with people, we are writing emails, we are writing documents, we are updating documents, etc., etc., etc. Communication is a huge part of project management. If you are an effective communicator, you can be an effective project manager. It's not the only essential, but if you're an ineffective communicator, you will have a hard time being a project manager because it's such a large part of what we do to be successful. Now, communication methods. We have interactive communication. That's when I can talk to you, you can talk to me. I can write to you, you can write to me. Text you name it, it's interactive. We have push communication. Now push communication stands for things that we simply push out. I may send you an email and you respond to it, or I might send you a report. That's pushing it out to you. In systems, we do this. Electronic systems may generate a report and push out a communication and not expect any kind of response, generally. So that's push communication. Don't need a response. When I send out meeting minutes, that's generally a type of push communication. No response necessary. We have pull communications. That's when we reach out and we pull in a report or we reach into a system and we have a certain report created for us and then downloaded to us. A paper from a website could be viewed as a pull communication because we're requesting it and we request the download and we give the parameters that the download has to happen on. We have formal communication methods. Those are generally things that have a length of time associated with them. Uh, documentation, we've talked about some of the project documents have to be formal. That means they're auditable in one way or another. They are, can be looked at and understood by multiple parties. Uh, that's kind of formal. The, juxtaposition that with informal which are things we don't think of anybody reading, perhaps. It may be there are certain emails that are more formal than others. Now realize all emails can be read by somebody, uh, maybe not the person you want them. So be careful with any electronic communication that you have. Now even our cell phone calls theoretically are being recorded. So the difference in formal and informal for our purposes, really are the expectation of who sees it. Formal means that it can be seen and auditable and be held responsible for those documents and in some way drive the project forward. Informal are more of quick communications between individuals uh, or groups of people, but they are not uh, viewed as being as mission critical in themselves. If it becomes mission critical, if a conversation between two parties becomes mission critical, then a formalized communication should be created. For instance, if you're talking about an issue and you send a text to somebody, you go, what do you think? And that text com comes back to you and says, I think X, Y, Z about this issue, we should escalate it to the boss. Then perhaps an email that, of the ex escalation is the formal communication of this conversation that's informal in text. 
So, formal, structured, it's agreed upon. Generally, it, it has the historical use to it. And the examples of the charter, the project plan, budget, meeting minutes. Informal, less structured, no historical records are generally kept, meaning that you're not expecting this to be accessed later for historical purposes. Again, all these, all your communications may be monitored and recorded. You never know. So be careful what you say and always remember that we're dealing with businesses here, organizations, governmental entities that have rules and regs and our, our standard of conduct should be appropriate at all times. Managing your communications. Your inputs include your communication management plan. So we've planned for our, our communication. We have our work performance reports. We have our enterprise environmental factors, our organizational process assets. We use our communication technologies, which we've talked about. We also use the communication models, our communication methods, information management systems as they exist within our organization, our project management office, etc. cetera, our, our performance reporting. And we get outputs from this process that include our project communications. We're managing communications, we're creating communications. And we also may update our project management plan and our project documents may be also updated. Because we communicate 90% of the time, that hopefully is making sense why a lot of the outputs of the processes that we talk about have a communication and an update of a plan, update of a document as part of the outputs. We also may be touching upon the organizational process assets, so we update those as well. Meetings. The plan with meetings. Use an agenda. Now, an agenda is an important piece to a meeting. It doesn't have to be sent out ahead of time, before the meeting. It is preferred to have be sent out so people can prepare. If the meeting is, is going to expect information from parties outside yourself, then it's a good idea to have a published agenda before the meeting so that people can be prepared. They can have the information readily available so that the meeting, is, uh, the meeting time is optimized so we don't waste time in the meeting for them to figure out what they were going to say. If you let them know what kind of questions you're going to ask or updates you're going to be requiring, they can be prepared ahead of time and we won't have uh, wasted time. Wasted time in meetings is one of, it's one of my pet peeves and it's one of those things that's a drag on the time element of all projects and all, a lot of, of uh, business works out there. As we put, distribute important documents before the meeting. So the agenda is important, but sometimes we don't have a, an agenda may be set in such a way that it's a common agenda. We have regular things that we will discuss. So publishing it doesn't necessarily mean anything, uh, or it has less meaning, I should say. But having important documents, if we're going to review documents, uh, requirements document, we may, re we, we may be, want to look at or a design document. Sending those things out ahead of time is a good idea so they can be reviewed. Preparation is everything when it comes to meetings. And the team should prepare. Be prepared for the meeting. The meeting should not surprise you unless it's an informal meeting called on the spur of the moment. But the meeting should not surprise you. And even a spur of the moment meeting, if you pull people together in, in a five minute uh, time frame, even then you should have some preparation that you've done, or at least explain why we're together. In, in lieu of an, a formal agenda, you have an informal one. 
why are we meeting? We're meeting to discuss an issue X, Y, Z, and we want to come up with a path forward. So that's why we're meeting and what we're trying to accomplish. Those two things should always be part of your agenda, and they should be a part of every meeting, even impromptu ones. The facilitator who called the meeting should establish leadership of it. That usually is the project manager or in, in sometimes it may be a business analyst or another team member who's more appropriate to that meeting. But they should establish leadership and they should drive the meeting to its uh, agendaed goal, meaning why are we here? And it should be driven in the time frame that the meeting was announced for. So we don't have a meeting that is non-ending. And we should drive to have a conclusion to the meeting and we should understand that yes, the meeting is now closed. You don't have to follow Robert's Rules of Order or any kind of formal type process, but you need to be aware that meetings are a place where we get work done and we should work as efficiently in that time space with those people as possible. When you call a meeting, remember what I said earlier, that a meeting is telling these people that you want to spend corporate assets to attain a goal. In a meeting, you're saying that the time that you're spending with these people, the invitees, is worthy of expending and that the corporate asset necessarily for them to be there is important to the success of the project and the goals of the company. Ground rules should be followed. We've talked about ground rules within your team. Part of those ground rules should be about the meeting structure and how we do meetings. So here's just another example of where we need to have ground rules. And sometimes they have to be uh, enforced. Uh, there's a reason that a lot of meetings in, in formal settings have a sergeant of arms. It's the person to make sure the rules are being followed. And in your meetings with projects, sometimes you need to remind people that the, the rules need to be followed. Meeting minutes should be created, and they don't have to be elaborate, but they should have a re record of what happened in the meeting, who was present, when was it, did it happen, the, the fundamental um, type of thing, and, and any decisions that were made, uh, any action items that were taken, that type of thing. You might have an action item log that you're keeping. That could be a part of the meeting. A lot of different people work uh, differently and it's hard for us to dictate. The point here is that this is part of your communication. Good meeting process is a uh, example of good project management. Now communication channels. We can, we can calculate our communication channels. And as part of the certification, we do look at this particular equation. And we're looking here. This is a formula for com computing the communication channels that exist within your project or within any organization. Because what we're saying is N times N minus one divided by two is our formula. N times N minus one divided by two. That's the formula. If you had eight members, then the formula works out as eight times eight minus one divided by two, or eight times seven divided by two, which is 56 divided by two, which is 28 channels. Now, what are we talking about channels? We're talking about the individual paths in your project. So if I have eight people, I'm talking to those eight people and they're talking to eight people or seven others. I'm talking to seven others, they're talking to seven others, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So those are unique ways that we touch upon each other, potentially. From a functional point of view, the thing to hold on to is that the more people you have, the more complex your communications. So you have to be more mindful of your communications and make sure everyone's included in those communications. From a, um, a certification standpoint, 
it's a question that you'll be asked and you need to have the right formula and, and implement it in the right way to be able to answer the questions that you might be asked. It's not something I use personally in my practical project management work in a formula setting, but it is something to be aware of because we sometimes forget how many people we actually are talking to and how many they are talking to. So the potential number of connections within a group of people is an important factor to take into account because it does demonstrate the complexity of the communications. Verbal and nonverbal. Now, we, we've talked a little bit about this. Verbal communication means the meaning of the words expressed to convey the message. Nonverbal is how the words are expressed and the body language that expresses them. Both of them are important. Both of them need to be taken into account. These are expressions that can be used in your conversations, your conflict resolutions, your negotiations, all of the different things. You might note that I, I, I would not talk to somebody that I have a conflict with that I'm getting a disconnect between their verbal communications and their nonverbal. They look shut off but they don't tell me that. They may be uh, confrontational with their words, but they aren't using body language that says that. that. They're just tools that you can use to improve your ability to communicate your feelings to your team and help them understand what you're trying to convey. We communicate through learned patterns. Now, this is an interesting uh, piece of, of communication. What do I mean by it? We, we communicate in patterns. We don't just use words. Our words come in patterns to us. When someone says, good morning, you might say, fine, how are you? Well, did they ask how you were? No, but you may have accessed a greeting. They're greeting me. So you greeted them back. Your pattern was in the right category, but your expression was off. So the point here is we do this in all our communications. We are not simply communicating in words and expressions. We're pulling up pieces of dialogue, of expression that we've heard before, that we've used before, that we think is appropriate, and we're hearing patterns from other people. So sometimes we don't hear the pattern the way it was meant. That's where bad communication can happen from, or miscommunication, not bad necessarily, but we can be miscommunicated because we heard the pattern inaccurately, or we interpreted it inaccurately. Remember when we looked at the model, it said we send a message encode, decode? It's the encoding and decoding is where the pattern recognition comes in or the pattern establishment. We establish the pattern, we recognize the pattern, we decode the pattern, etc. We're learning patterns. We do it early, continuously, unconsciously. We, this is not a conscious thing. You can consciously be recognition. You can have recognition of it that you're doing it. But it's not something that you can consciously say, okay, I want to learn patterns today or I want to unlearn patterns. It's something we always do. It's part of who we are and how our brains work and how communication is, is done. And there's patterns are both word patterns and physical patterns. And so as we've talked about, the nonverbal is so important. Our, our expressions, our body language. So both of those have patterned behavior associated with it and patterned communication. We get the wrong response from a perceived pattern, that's where we have problems, as I said. You can learn through conscious effort to establish new patterns. Let me give you an example. It, it, conscious effort. There's a uh, idea that we shouldn't use the word but because it cuts people off. When someone looks at you and says something, you go, but, but, but. You're really just devaluing what they're saying 
and wanting to shut them down so that you can say what you're going to say. Instead of saying, but, think of saying, and. So if, they, if someone's in a meeting and they say, we need six more days for this testing effort. Now, you may want to add there's some other things that have to go there. Instead of saying, but what about, say, and have we considered these other elements? You're not devaluing what they've said. You're including it and expanding on it. Just a small example. There's a lot of examples that you could, you could use for this. And the purpose here is to get you, is, is to share with you this idea and help you understand better communications. Ten key skills. We're going to go through these. Ten key communication skills. Know your audience when you're communicating, written or in, in person. Know who your audience is. Think about it. Who am I talking to? Know your content. What am I trying to say? What am I trying to communicate to this party or parties? Be specific with it. Don't be too generalized with your comments. Say specifically what you want. C3. I put C3 on post-it notes, put them on my screen when I'm typing things, when I'm talking on the phone. It means be clear, concise, complete. Clear, concise, complete. This is a trick to keep your brain focused on what you're trying to do when you're in a communication. I need to be clear with what I'm saying. I need to be concise, not talk too much. I need to be complete. Clear, concise, complete. Make sure I get all the information in. Practice dynamic listening. We've talked about listening before. Be a good listener. Practice dynamic listening. Listen, reframe, give good feedback, body language, see me nodding my head. I would be listening, I'd be hearing, and my body language says, I hear what you're saying. I would also add into that, what, you know, reframe what they're saying. Things like that are very good to become a better communicator. Think proactively. Here's a communication skill that a lot of, a lot of project managers are, are proactive or think they are. And by that, I mean they act proactively. They are sending notes out or they're sending messages. They may be calling meetings and checking with people and sending reports. And it may, that's all well and good. There's nothing wrong with that if that's appropriate to the job you're doing. But think proactively. Don't simply act for action's sake. Acting proactively sometimes becomes clutter. And it's clutter for you, the project manager, and clutter for your team. Because if you're constantly sending out notes and reminders and things just to make sure everyone knows you're working, that's not really thinking proactively. Thinking proactively is thinking about what needs to happen next, who needs to know about it, what do I need to do, being ahead of the curve, looking over the hill as much as you can not just walking up to the hill. Be genuine, be honest. You know, sometimes we can't t say things as project managers, that's true. We can't always, you know, if someone asks us a direct question, we can always say, I am not able to answer that. I do not have that information, or I do not have the power to comment on that. No comment is an appropriate thing in a uh, uh, organizational structure because project managers sometimes have privy to things that other people in the team aren't. And you may be asked. So be genuine, be honest, and be willing to say, I, I can't say that. But if you can, if you can be genuine and be honest with your communication, it will be highly effective if you can be honest, not cruel, not brutal, but honest. If you have a problem, talk about it rather than hiding it. Again, think proactively of what will happen later if I'm not honest now. 
Control the communications, don't let them control you. That just means be mindful of, of in a communication setting and, and be willing to exert yourself, even if you're not the facilitator, so that you understand what's going on. Ask questions. Think, and, think proactively, listen dynamically, ask questions, which, and listen and control both your, as much as you can, your body language, so you don't project, project things you're not trying to. You know, you, our body language is important. We've been talking about that. Make sure that you are in control of that body language as much as you can be, and that you're projecting what you want to. Marry, marrying, putting together your words and your body language and your tone of voice are what good communicators do. It helps communication be successful. Again, ask good questions. Be willing to ask questions and think about what questions are good questions and what aren't. Now we look at the process of controlling communications. We control communications after we have put all our communication together, our plan is together, we're managing it, but we also control it. And we go through some specific steps. Our inputs include our project management plan, our project communications, our issues log, our work performance data, our organizational process assets. And we use our information management systems. If we have systems in place in which we are getting uh, information from, information is communications. So we would use those systems. Our expert judgment is at play here because we're trying to make sure that all the communications are clear and, and are appropriate to what we're trying to do. Remember, we're trying to use the communications to help a project be successful, and that, that's what we have to keep mindful of all the time. We use our meetings where we talk with people, and we use the information from those meetings. Work performance information is one of those outputs that we get from this process, as well as change requests, project management plan updates, and project document updates. We also may touch on the organizational process assets and update those as we see appropriate. One of the things that would be in that group of documentation or processes that we would look at are things that we touch on, a new format or template for our meetings or meeting minutes, maybe things that we would update, or give an example of a new template, for example. Performance status reporting, or performance reporting, we call it status reporting, it bounces around. Here we're looking at past performance. So we can't be planning communications, and we are managing it right now too, but we're looking at how past performance, so some things must have happened to be looking at past performance, and our status reporting is gonna give us what we've seen. Now, we also may get projections for the future. Project forecasts are things that we look at too. How my past performance has gone, where is my performance going in the future? We talked about this with some of our metrics that we dealt with with earned value management, which can point towards are we on schedule, are we on budget. Things like that can be part of the status reporting that we do on a regular basis. So we're communicating the data that we create. We have processes to create the data. Now we need to turn that data information into something that other people who need it can use. We may see statuses on issues in our, our performance reporting, our status report. Often we have a short place for open issues. Sometimes if projects have a large number of issues or we're using certain tools that would allow us to do this, we have collaborative tools that we might use 
And there's collaborative tools we may be able to just log into in our status meeting and be able to look at the issues and deal with them in real time, getting uh, updates from the owners of the different issues or finding out if there's any more information, that type of thing. We also may report back on the work that's completed. Have we finished any modules? Have we finished any work? Can we say, you know, we're good to go on a certain piece or another piece? When we deal with iterative processes like Agile or Scrum, these reports may be slightly different because the work is constructed differently. And because it's an iterative, we get pieces reported back on. We may construct these reports in a different way, show a slightly different flavor. The point is not that this is a hard, fast form that we need to fill out. A status report can come in a lot of different forms and a lot of different templates exist out there. You can Google it or Bing it or Yahoo it and you can find a lot of different types of formats that, and, and each format will contain different data points. The point of the status is to communicate clearly what our past performance, our, pro, our, our project forecasts, what we're looking for in terms of issues and the status on those, any work that's completed, and to try and make sure that we have all pertinent information in a way that is displayed clearly for the recipients of the status report. We also look at the work to be completed, generally in the next time frame. So think of it as what we've done in the past, how we're doing, looking forward, what work needs to be completed or is destined or scheduled to be completed in the next time frame. Time frame, what I'm referring to there is if we're doing status reports on a weekly basis, it would be within the next week. If it's a monthly basis, it would be in the next month, etc. And we look for changes approved. In our status report, we're always looking at the change requests that have gone out there and want to keep up with them. Hopefully, there's not a lot of changes that happen in any time frame. But if there are, we need to keep up with those. We need to give a status on the, their, their um, uh, approval status, as well as if there's any more information needed. Changes don't always go through and are approved right away. They may be uh, pending approval, they may need more information. Changes can be rejected. Remember, it is a request for a change, not a demand for a change. And other relevant information, the I idea behind a lot of this communication is that we want to make sure it's relevant to the parties and the project that we're doing. It's specific. It's not generalized. Now, there may be general categories, which we've mentioned, but they're not the concrete things that have to be on there. I haven't even mentioned some of the things that you probably al already would put on there. Project name. Date your name. Those are obvious. Things like that we, we don't talk about. It's the pertinent information to get you thinking about what could be pertinent and useful as a reporting point and that could be reported on on a regular basis. That way you, number one, and all the parties that get your status report know what's happening and it may be that there are bad things that you report. One of the ways of looking at status that's used often is the red, yellow, uh, green status. If your project's in green, generally it means everything's okay. If it's in yellow, then there's an issue reported that may or may not uh, hit one of the triple constraints. Or it could be red, which means pretty much we've got a big problem. Now, understand that kind of statusing is, is very useful, but it has to be accurate, and everybody would agree with that, and you have to be willing 
and have a culture that's willing to use it on an accurate method. There may be a, an, a, an issue within an organization concerning using the red, green, yellow statusing because they feel that all projects should be in the green all the time and they're fearful that it will reflect badly on them if any project is in yellow or, or red status. And the fact is the statusing is not there to say that people are not working. Projects go into the yellow, in the red even, because it's real people doing real things at real time. And there are problems that do come up. There are changes that need to be made. There are issues that are out of the control of the project manager or the program office or even the organization that need to be taken into account. So I, I urge you to understand how the statusing works, and it's not simply a report card that says, am I doing well or not? Being in the green does not mean you're doing your job necessarily, nor does being in the red. They're simply statuses of the work that you were trying to corral and get done. And as we've seen, many of us who have done project management, there's some great pictures of people hurting kittens or other silliness. And we laugh at them. We say, that's what a project is like. I'm hurting kittens. And we laugh because sometimes it feels like that. Project management is not for the faint of heart. When you look at the idea of statusing your, your projects, Look at it as being as brutally honest with yourself as well as others and campaign to make sure that that honesty is rewarded for itself as well as useful to find out what's going on with the project and solve it with actionable steps that can bring the project into a green status if that's what is desired. Remember, we're trying to make successful projects. Use the step. Mm -hmm.